Hi, welcome to Metal Floss Video. It's almost Mother's Day here in the United States, so today we're gonna learn about the holiday and just moms in general, because moms are awesome, especially my mom. Let's get started. In 2015, a study about teen risk-taking was published in the Journal of Social, Cognitive, and Effective Neuroscience. The lead researcher, Eva Telzer, and her colleagues wanted to find out whether adolescents would take fewer risks if their moms were watching. To do this, they had 14-year-olds play a driving game. There were 25 adolescents total in the study, and they received fMRI scans while playing the game, which allowed the researchers to analyze blood flow in the participants' brains. The game had multiple stoplights. As the adolescent approached a light, they had to press a stop button or a go button. The objective was to make it through the course as fast as possible, and crashing the car meant they'd be delayed for longer than they would have been if they had just stopped. So choosing to drive through a yellow stoplight was the risky behavior here. A participant would play through the game once alone, and they would play another time knowing that their mom was watching. The teenagers made about 55% risky choices while playing the game alone. But in the games their moms watched, there were less risky choices, about 45%. According to Telzer, the researchers considered that a big effect. The fMRI scans provided some interesting data, too. When an adolescent played alone and took the risk of running a yellow light, their ventral striatum, a region linked to hedonistic rewards, was activated. But that activity did not occur when a teen being watched by their mom took the the same risk. And other studies have shown that adolescents get this boost from the ventral striatum while taking risks more than other age groups like children and adults. Their mom being there reducing that reward might have, in essence, taken the fun out of being risky, as the authors suggested. And when teens stopped the car at a yellow light while their mom watched, the connections between the ventral striatum and the prefrontal cortex were activated. That didn't happen when they were alone. In the words of the study, these results suggest that mothers boost self-control by increasing prefrontal cortex activation, facilitating more deliberative and safe decisions. Thanks, Mom. We were all raised by plenty of TV moms. Time for some quick facts. It's a mystery what happened to Carol Brady's first husband before she married Mike. Florence Henderson, who played Carol, revealed her theory on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and she said, I killed him. Speaking of television-related murder, Lauren Graham almost overdosed on coffee while playing Lorelai Gilmore on Gilmore Girls. Well, kind of. She once jokingly said, I drink a lot of coffee. I would get to this place on set where if I had any more, I was going to keel over dead. So sometimes there was water in there. To prepare for the role of Morticia Adams on The Adams Family, Angelica Houston watched the documentary Grey Gardens. Isabel Sanford wasn't convinced that audiences would buy her and Sherman Hemsley as a couple on The Jeffersons. She once called him a little man that she could squash like a bug. We know Wilma Flintstone's maiden name, it's Slaghoople, but some cartoons give her the maiden name Pebble. Flintstones fan sites came up with all sorts of complicated explanations. Marriages, Pebble being a middle name, but according to Flintstones expert Earl Cress, unfortunately, it's just as simple as Hanna-Barbera not caring about the continuity. Family Matters was a spin-off of Perfect Strangers. The character of Harriet Winslow, played by Jo Marie Payton, was the elevator operator on Perfect Strangers before her family got their own show. Speaking of spin-offs, there is a cartoon spin-off of Roseanne called Little Rosie, which aired in 1990. It only made it to 13 episodes before getting canceled. Not everyone is a fan of June Cleaver's fancy high heels at home look, but it turns out there's a reason. She originally wore flats, but then the actors who played her sons had growth spurts. So the character got heels so she could stay as tall as possible compared to her kids. Julie Bowen has won two Emmys for her portrayal of Claire Dunphy on Modern Family, which is lucky because the first Emmy broke. Her son took a golf club to the trophy, attempting to hit the ball-shaped part of it, which snapped one of the arms. The notoriously mean Lucille Bluth of Arrested Development is based on a real person, believe it or not. When the show's creator, Mitch Hurwitz, was developing the character, he was inspired by his mother-in-law. Yikes. Although Hurwitz believes much of the meanness was due to Jessica Walter. He has said, it's written passive-aggressively and Jessica does it aggressive. Estelle Harris, on the other hand, couldn't use anyone as inspiration for the role of Estelle Costanza on Seinfeld. She once explained, 
Nobody had a past like that. I mean, that poor woman. She lived in that apartment that they got married in with the same furniture and the same husband and one son that was a loser. Connie Britton and Kyle Chandler, Tammy and Eric Taylor on Friday Night Lights, had an interesting way of getting to know each other. They had to move to Austin, Texas for the show, so they road tripped there together from LA. Kind of. They drove at the same time in separate cars, but used walkie-talkies to communicate. In the pilot of Family Guy, Lois Griffin was blonde. Some fans speculate that's why Chris is the only Griffin with blonde hair. He actually got it from his mother. But soon after, she was a redhead. In the 90s, First Lady Barbara Bush called The Simpsons the dumbest thing she had ever seen. Soon after, she got a letter from none other than Marge Simpson, who was deeply hurt by the criticism of her family. What a good mom. She received an apology letter from Barbara Bush in response. Moving on from TV moms to animal moms, there are some very interesting ways of parenting in the animal kingdom. Like allo mothering is when animals other than the genetic parents step into a parental role. Elephants commonly use this practice. According to research, elephant calves receive protection from their mothers as well as multiple other females. These are usually elephants within their family though, like aunts, sisters, or cousins. And they benefit from being allo mothers because they're usually young elephants themselves, so they're learning how to mother. Female cuckoo birds lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, then ditch the eggs because raising babies is too much work. Girl, I hear you. Researchers have even studied young cuckoos for their ability to trick their foster parents into feeding them. Although, if a bird notices an egg that's not theirs, they won't hesitate to throw it out of the nest. Lions are definitely more like elephants than cuckoo birds. Lionesses leave their prides to give birth to their cubs. They even continue to stay away for four to six weeks as they start to raise their cubs, but then they return to the pride and an entire group of lionesses raise them. Lactating female lions will nurse any cub in their pride. Killer whales and bottlenose dolphins also have an interesting post-birth routine. They stay awake for an entire month. One team of researchers found that newborns came up for air every three to 30 seconds without any sleep. Their mothers not only stay awake with them, but they also lead them through the water the entire time at a quick pace. This is a very unusual practice. Animals usually sleep more after being birthed or giving birth. Like the cuckoo bird, a female emperor penguin ditches her egg, but first she finds a male to take care of it. Then the mom embarks on a major journey to find food. She travels to the ocean and could be gone for about two months. For some, it's around 50 miles away from their regular habitat, and she brings the food back for her chick. Some skinks eat their own eggs. If they notice that they've laid eggs near a bunch of predators, they just consume the eggs and move on. This is known as whole clutch filial cannibalism. Flowers have different symbolic meanings that vary depending upon person, situation, and culture. But since many of you will be buying a bouquet for your mom this year, let's talk a little about the commonly interpreted symbolisms. Carnations have been called the Mother's Day flower. Generally, the flower represents love. As for what color to buy, pink has been interpreted as a symbol of a mother's love and also gratitude. Other flower experts recommend white, which represents pure love and luck because you're lucky to have your mom. In general, tulips represent romantic love, although they can also symbolize rebirth. If you're buying tulips for family, the best bets are probably yellow, which once represented jealousy, but now mean cheerful thoughts, or pink, which is platonic affection or care. If you ask around, you'll hear a lot of different symbolic meanings for the daisy. Loyalty, true love, innocence, cheerfulness, but it might be a good one for new moms on Mother's Day. Daisies can represent new beginnings, as can daffodils. Most people connect roses and roses romance, but there are a couple good color options for the holiday. Pink roses represent gratitude and appreciation, and yellow are good for well wishes and joy, but many prefer to use them to represent friendship. Lilies are a popular Mother's Day flower. Some view them as generally representing motherhood and happiness. White lilies can mean modesty and majesty, which is maybe something your mom wants you to call her. As far as we know, though, humans are the only animals to celebrate Mother's Day. The holiday has some interesting origins. Some of the earliest known ways to honor mothers were festivals in ancient Greece and Rome that primarily focused on mother goddesses like Rhea and Sibylle. And then there was also something known as Mothering Sunday in early Christian history, but that sort of disappeared and then eventually the Mother's Day we know today took over. This current holiday came to be thanks primarily to one woman named Anna Jarvis from Webster, West Virginia. Now, there were a few other people who 
who tried to start similar holidays, like abolitionist and suffragist Julia Ward Howe and temperance activist Juliette Calhoun Blakely, but it was really Jarvis who drove the movement. So when Anna Jarvis was a young girl, she supposedly heard her mom, Anne, praying for a day to commemorate mothers. That's right, Anne named her daughter Anna, thereby making this story very difficult to follow. Anne, the mother, ran these things called Mother's Day Work Clubs, which basically taught moms how to mom, and historian Catherine Lane Antolini theorizes that Anne Jarvis probably meant this theoretical prayer holiday to be a community service day in which mothers would help out less fortunate mothers. But Anna, the daughter, who for the record never actually had children, remembered that prayer, and eventually, after her mom died, Anna started writing to the governors of every state about creating a mother. Mother's Day. She wanted it to be the second Sunday of May, which was the Sunday closest to the anniversary of her own mother's death. And it wasn't just governors. She wrote to anyone she thought could help draw attention to her cause, including Mark Twain. In 1908, Anna helped hold the first Mother's Day service at Andrews Methodist Episcopal Church in Grafton, West Virginia. It was financially backed by a department store owner in Philadelphia, who also held a Mother's Day event at one of his stores. And two years later, West Virginia became the first state to pass a law making Mother's Day an official holiday. Other states followed until in 1914 Congress passed a law designating the second Sunday of May Mother's Day. Imagine that! Congress passing a law. Okay, so this is where things get a little weird. Anna Jarvis had begged many, many people to adopt this holiday, so she believed that she held the copyright to Mother's Day. Like, in her mind, Mother's Day was her intellectual property. And she spent a lot of time from then on fighting with people about it. The more the holiday became commercialized, the more miserable she became. She'd intended it just as a holiday to spend time with your mom and thank her for everything. I guess she forgot about the financial help from that department store owner. Anna got into a fight with Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady of New York at the time, because they were on different Mother's Day committees. On another occasion, she went to a Philadelphia tea room owned by her friend that happened to have a dish called Mother's Day Salad on the menu. Anna ordered it and then threw it on the floor! She also always signed her letters, Anna Jarvis, comma, founder of Mother's Day. The media, of course, loved Anna's anger. They would report on her escapades and the many news releases she would write, like this one, What will you do to to rout charlatans, bandits, pirates, racketeers, kidnappers, and other termites that would undermine with their greed one of the finest, noblest, and truest movements and celebrations. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Thanks for watching Mental Floss Video, which is made with the help of all of these nice people. Please subscribe to our channel if you'd like to see more scatterbrained videos, and as they say in our hometown, don't forget to be awesome.